Lately, I see a lot of people kind of panicking about food storage. I mean, do they have enough? But often I see them overlooking, in my opinion, the number one most important thing to have in your food storage. Do you know what that is? Hey, my resilient citizens, it's Prepper Potpourri here with another food storage video. If you're not a subscriber, please click on that subscribe button below and click on that little bell icon so you can be notified every time I post a new video. The number one food storage item, I don't think it's even food really, it's a liquid. That's right, it's water. We can live three weeks without food, wouldn't be pleasant, but we would survive but only about three days without water. So it's extremely, extremely important to have in your preps. And lately I've been seeing videos full of beautiful food stored, but hardly any water. So I have to ask, do you have a backup plan for your water storage? You know, enough to meet your family's need in an emergency. Now, the truth is you can only store so much water. Water is heavy. One gallon of water weighs 8.3 pounds. And you know, we're told to have one gallon of water per day for each family member. And extra if we have pets. So for a family of four, for just one month storage, that would be 120 gallons of water, which would weigh almost a thousand pounds. So if you have enough for your family of four, two months storage, you're already up to water that is weighing a ton. Well, a lot of us just don't have space for that. Uh, you know, if you live in an apartment, a smaller house, depending on the weather conditions you live in, you really can't store lots and lots of water. You might have to rent a storage unit to be able to store the water you need. So that's why it's important to have a water backup plan. Now, if you are storing water, I do want to caution you, make sure it is in food grade containers and check them often. Um, something like this can leak, right? It could cause really a mess in your house depending on where you're keeping it. So make sure it's stored properly. So here's some of my backup plan. I hope it'll give you ideas. Are you on city water or well water? You know, if you're on city water, you depend on the city to provide your water and you depend on them to provide it without any contaminants. In my case, I live rural and we are on a well. But what happens when we lose power? Yeah, no water out of the faucet. So I did install a manual system that brings the water into my basement and I have a pump that I can pump up and get water when we lose power. And that works as long as your water table isn't too deep. It's something that a lot of times Mennonites are using. So that's one of my backup plans. So here are my potable water sources. Yep, I do store quite a bit of bottled water in my basement. And if something happened that leaked, it's only going on a cement floor, so it's not going to ruin anything. And this water, you know, actually contained water is the only water that would be safe to drink if there was a radiation exposure. Only something like this or something that you have bottled yourself. Now, I was watching a video some time ago where they had, was it called Red Algae Bloom or something? Anyway, it was contaminating the city's water supply. And so everybody was rushing to the store and on the shelves, there was no water available at all. But I kind of laughed because in those same views of the grocery store, there was pop on the shelf. There was milk or canned milk. 
and there was juice. So remember, if you're thirsty, there are other things that can provide and quench your thirst other than just this water. And I also stock a lot of home canned juices. Um, in this case, believe it or not, it's rhubarb juice. But mainly I have grape juice and cherry juice and sometimes even peach juice, apple juice. But I home can it and I have a lot of this in my storage. So this would go great if there was an emergency and we didn't have enough water. Now do remember, if you'd run out of water, a lot of times there is liquid in the canned goods on your shelf. Now you might buy canned fruit, in this case it's home canned peaches, but look at all the liquid in that. And again, you might have evaporated milk or, what is this? This is evaporated, but different milk products on your shelf. And it, these will quench your thirst. And I have two hot water tanks. So I have about another 100 gallons of potable water. But if you, you're using water to heat your house, you don't want to use the water from those tanks. But if you got desperate, you do have water in your hot water tanks. And we have four of these. Now there's about 1.6 to 7 gallons of water. The 7 gallons is only if you have a really old toilet pre-1982 because they held more. But you're not drinking water from here. It's from here, okay, in the tank. Now if you use a chemical disinfectant or purifier, you know, like those little blue tabs, if you add that to your tank, um, you can't drink it. But if you get desperate enough, you can get water out of your toilet tank. And supposedly, you don't have to disinfect it. Although if I was able to boil it, I still would. Also have this rain barrel system where rain comes off our outbuilding, goes in here, there's a screen, and the water is stored here in the barrel. So it's a great idea to keep some water. But of course, we would disinfect this water if we were using it. But right now, it's great for watering the plants. Your next step is checking out on your property and around your neighborhood, what are the sources of water available? Now these sources are water that you are going to have to disinfect to make it potable, but you need to know where they're located. Maybe you have a pool or there's a pool in your neighborhood. My understanding is pools can hold 18,000 gallons of water or more. Now personally, even after boiling pool water, I would not drink it, but it would be great for your hygiene needs. Now my house is built right close to a creek that meanders all the way through my property. We're very, very lucky. And this is a source of water. And our neighbor has a big pond. Although it would be one of the first places I would want to use because the geese seem to love landing on there. And living in Michigan, we have lakes everywhere. We're very, very lucky. And maybe you have a natural spring on your property or you know where one is located. That's fantastic. Now, if you are collecting water from these sources, you still need to disinfect them. For any of the following methods, if the water is cloudy, First, filter it through a clean cloth, a t-shirt, a paper towel, coffee filter, something into another clean container. Which actually looks pretty darn clear. And the best way to disinfect your water is boiling. That's right. All you have to do is bring it up to a rolling boil for one minute. At elevations above 6,500 feet, boil for three minutes. Boiling is the surest method to kill disease-causing germs, including viruses, bacteria, and parasites. And you can improve the flat taste of boiled water by pouring it from one container to another and then allowing it to stand for a few hours, or adding a pinch of salt for each quart or liter of boiled water. So if you don't have safe bottled water or aren't able to boil water, your next alternative is to chemically disinfect it through something like household bleach or iodine or chlorine dioxide tablets. 
These chemical disinfectants can kill most harmful or disease-causing bacteria or viruses, but most of these are not effective as boiling water when you want to kill more resistant germs such as parasites, cryptosporidium, and giardia. Now iodine may be used as a disinfectant, but water that has been disinfected with iodine is not recommended for pregnant women, people with thyroid problems, or those with known hypersensitivity to iodine. It's also not recommended for continuous use. So don't use it for more than a few weeks at a time. You just need to add five drops of 2% tincture of iodine to each quart or liter of water that you are disinfecting. If the water is cloudy or colored, add 10 drops of iodine. Stir and let the water stand for at least 30 minutes before use. Chlorine dioxide tablets like these tablets can disinfect water and kill Giardia, if you follow the manufacturer's instructions correctly. I always keep some of these tablets in my EDC. Household bleach can come in different concentrations. It's typically in the U.S. between 5 and 9 percent. Just make sure the bleach you're using is the regular one, not the scented bleach. And here is a handy chart to tell you how much bleach is needed. An eyedropper should be part of your preps, but what if you don't have one handy? Creek Stewart showed a handy MacGyver hack. You just put a little bleach in the cap and a piece of toweling, let the toweling absorb it, squeeze out a drop from the toweling into the water that you are trying to disinfect. Works like a charm. Now, After applying that bleach, let the water stand 30 minutes before drinking. But now it's important to do the sniff test. That's right. Sniff it. Does it smell like chlorine? Should have a little smell of chlorine. If not, do that treatment again the same amount and let it stand for an additional 15 minutes and then do your sniff test. I've included a link below for a handout I developed for using bleach in your water. If you want to click on that in the description box for this video, and print out that handout, it would be great for your prepping manual. The problem with Clorox bleach is that after six months, it starts decreasing in its strength. So many preppers suggest using pool shock or calcium hypochlorite granules. And they have a shelf life of at least 10 years. You can use these granules to disinfect larger amounts of water, like the emergency water in your rain barrel. It would take only one fourth teaspoon of dry calcium hypochlorite powder to disinfect the water in a 55 gallon barrel. The standard calculation for a 5% stock solution is to dissolve one and one half teaspoons of 68 to 70% dry calcium hypochlorite in one cup of water. Now take care not to breathe in the fumes when you're mixing the hypochlorite because that is listed as a health hazard by OSHA. Personally, I do not include pool shock in my preps for various reasons. You know, it's really made for pools, not for human consumption. And the substance is extremely corrosive. And care must be taken when storing it long term because even though calcium hypochlorite is not flammable, it is an oxidizer which may ignite combustibles, such as wood or paper and oil. So it should never ever be stored near reactive or combustible materials. If you got a fire from it, it can be difficult to put out because it's self-perpetuating, because it is releasing oxygen and chlorine. So if you do decide to store it, make sure you're storing it in a safe place where it will be kept dry cannot get wet and will not be near other combustible materials. But my backup plan is the boiling water. I really think that's a better way to go, better than bleach. And I have many methods which I can boil water with. My rocket stove works with just little twigs putting in it. So for me, I don't go the chemical disinfectant route. But 
you may be fine with that and not have a problem with using pool shock. But if you are interested in using pool shock, I have a link below to an article by the Provident Preppers, which I think is excellent. And you should read it and probably print it off and put it in your prepping manual. Approved water filters. You know, many, many preppers swear by Berkey water filters. They have the big unit that sits on their countertop and they are using it all the time, not just in emergency situations. I do not have a Berkey, but I do have a Hydro Blue Pressurized Jerry Can just in case I would need that. That again is one of my water backups. And I always carry a personal water filter in my EDC kit, in my go bag, in my car. You get the idea. So I always have something to use. If something would happen and I'm on the road and I don't have any potable water. There are also personal UV filters such as the Steri Pen Classic UV Water Purifier and it states that it purifies one liter in 90 seconds and has the capability of purifying up to 150 liters on one set of AA battery. Again, I do not own a UV sterilizing instrument so I do not use it but it may work for you especially if you're thinking about having something for a camping trip. Now the above methods I've been talking about are for fresh water, not for seawater or salt water. They won't work. For salt water, um, there are plans on the internet to make your own still, which uses a steam process to give you drinkable water from salt water, but it's usually smaller quantities. But it is something to think about if you live near an ocean. I just read an article where some students may have discovered a way to make a water bottle that turns salt water into drinking water. If that comes to fruition, it would be great for those of you who live near salt water. But right now, it's just hypothetical. So make sure you have adequate backup plans to provide you and your family with the water you would need in an emergency. Think about it now. Get the preps you need now before something would happen. There are links to some of the products described in this video below. And as always, please subscribe and share the knowledge. Thank you.